All right, so I want to start off tonight reading an email from, uh, and also check out this hail, first of all, from severe-e, or dash-weather dash EU. It's not snow, folks. That is hail on the highway. Highway to hail. All right, but on a more serious note, and I hate to be like this, but I wanted to share this email because as I said earlier in the broadcast, I've spoke with Rex several times uh, via email. Nice guy. And this is the first time I've, I've kind of seen like the true concern and genuine concern in the tone of this email. And I'll go ahead and read it. He says, I was heading to Sabetha, Kansas to pick up my three granddaughters for a visit. We always meet in Sabetha. It's about halfway. Yesterday's trip was the first chance I've had to take a drive down I-29 from Omaha since the first flood that occurred this spring. In fact, I was driving back from Sabetha the day before that flood. Words will never be able to describe adequately the shock and sorrow I felt seeing all those fields underwater. Still, after all this time, it's a little longer trip taking the interstate, but the drive is effortless. Normally, I would have to cut over to the Nebraska side at Highway 2, but it's still underwater. 34 is underwater, still. 136, underwater, still. 159, closed. I ended up having to drive to St. Joseph and take 36 across Kansas. I would not hesitate to say that all the farm ground between Missouri River and the bluffs that run parallel to 129 on the east, that there were maybe 10 fields that had something worthwhile growing in them. The corn bins that were busted open from swollen wet corn were many. Anything that can float from tires, propane tanks, fuel tanks, insulation, whole trees and branches of all sizes, mountains of corn stalks, small buildings, drifts of sand, dried moss, many, many items I could not identify stuck in fences, leaning on houses and just scattered randomly as far as the eye could see. Many pieces of equipment sitting around with high water marks on the tires obviously have not moved since. In years past, I would have seen an endless sea of tassels by this time of year. I drove through uh, the Peshevel, which was my usual shortcut, Highway 2, and the town looked to be as a war zone with huge heaps of damaged furniture, drywall, and trash, rot rotten and stinky, and then south of town, I hit the road close sign again. I had to backtrack to the interstate. Many roads, including interstate, had huge washouts, 12 to 30 inches deep, at the end, at the edge of the pavement. Maps say it's some 130 miles between Omaha, St. Joseph, Missouri, and from what I could find, roughly 600 river miles, considering a fractal look from all the twists and turns the river takes on its normal path. I could not find any how many acres are included in that stretch of flood pan, but considering most of those fields are five to a thousand acres, 500 to a thousand acres each. I cannot count on both hands how many fields on the whole trip down there are even planted and count on one hand number of fields that are worth uh, running a combine through. So he's saying there's about a couple of hands or fields that were planted and on one hand, he could count the fields that were worth running a combine through. Just think that this is just a very small region out of the whole Missouri-Mississippi floodplain that has been devastated. I have tears in my eyes just talking about it, what I saw. It's one thing to hear about it on the news, but driving through it was sickening. You feel like you're driving through the middle of an inland sea. What a catastrophe for us all. Thank you, Rex, for sharing that uh, email with me today. And I think that's why there's a lot of people that have turned their attention to the Grand Solar Minimum community, is that they're seeing these things for their own eyes. This is not something reported on any of these other YouTube channels or this one including. Um, this is something that he already knew about, very aware of, very on board with everything. But seeing it for himself like this really made an impact. And I'm sure it would make all of us feel the same about what he saw today. And 
what's concerning is that we're only talking a few hundred miles here and there's all this damage think about the rest of the areas that have been flooded out since March February January so there's a lot of cleanup our insurance claims are going to go skyrocket through the roof this year which could lead to higher prices next year if if some of these insurance companies are even in business after this year and they're saying it's supposed to get worse so I don't, I don't think we can stress enough folks that uh, that we need to really start having a plan in place and ready to go uh, buying food that you can store uh, Mari and I have, have started once again we she already had a decent start but nowhere near what we need to, to be okay for a while so Mari and I have started once again as well uh, Mari and I talked about um, doing some patreon videos on food storage and what we're going to be doing for that period of time where food could be at a very emergency crisis level so Again, guys, this is uh, kind of sobering stuff. It's not the fun stuff to report on, but you know, 130 miles looking this bad, I can't imagine what the rest of the region looks like that's been flooded out and how it's going to take its toll. Uh, we're going to get some real answers by August, hopefully, and January we'll know for sure what the exact numbers are, which I'm bracing myself for that one. Got this in my email today, too, and uh, well, tomorrow is curb your energy use day tomorrow here in upstate New York and they want us to limit our peak use of electricity between the hours of 3 and 7 they don't want us using our air conditioners they want us to reduce the use of air conditioners by pre-cooling your home turn up your thermostat a few degrees use do not use large appliances during non-peak hours so between three and seven you can't cook dinner sorry use fans to help spread cool air around this is just because tomorrow we are expected to see temperatures rise into the 90s humidity is going to be about 100 percent with dew points approaching 70. so it's going to be very oppressive for folks here in new york all over new york the East Coast alike. A lot of these houses up here don't have central air and heating because it doesn't get this hot usually in the summertime. Especially in Buffalo. When I lived in Buffalo, I don't think any house was included with uh, any kind of central air and heating, period. Um, living there for a short period of time, for about two years, I think the temperatures got in the 90s maybe once or twice. So it, it wasn't like this. But I find it interesting that we know we have a very dangerous situation coming up especially on saturday we've got heat advisories out right now for saturday as we're going to see temperatures at 95 degrees for a high with 100 percent humidity and 70 or 70 degrees dew point at least very oppressive situation but our power company wants us to take it down a notch use fans to cool your house turn the air conditioner down don't cook anything between three and seven uh, eat an early dinner, I guess, or eat a late dinner. No big deal. But once in a while is one thing. This is the kind of thing that us New Yorkers are going to be facing in the future when they attempt to try to get rid of coal and natural gas. These are the kind of notices we're going to get. They're going to, they're going to realize this real fast, and I think they're kind of getting us ready for it. It's like they're like preseason roll out blackouts coming your way here's how we get ready for them okay let's let's give it a fancy title let's call it curb energy use day Woo! all right dangerous heat wave to expand from the plains midwest to the east into this weekend just as i was talking about according to weather.com hot temperatures will spread from the plains to the east coast this weekend, the heat indices will rise to dangerous levels in those parts of the region. Let's check it out. So excessive heat warning is in the pink. Uh, a lot of New York, a lot of Pennsylvania, all of Ohio, Kentucky, West Virginia, parts of southern Michigan, Illinois, Iowa, 
Missouri, parts of Arkansas, parts of Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, and the southeastern tip of South Dakota. The bordering areas around those states that I just mentioned are under a, a heat advisory, but an excessive heat warning is a little bit different. And uh, let's go into that here. When com um, so the temperatures ranging from mid 90s to near 100 degrees are likely to encompass much of the central region. United, look at this! Wow, 105 degrees in Columbus, Ohio, folks. That's pretty freaking hot. 108 degrees on Friday. Now this is the heat index. Okay, this is not the actual surface temperature, but it's going to feel like with the combination of the humidity and the dew point levels we are looking at temperatures over and in well into the triple digits most of the east coast ohio indiana illinois is going to get at the worst the east coast dc good lord 107 111 109 through the weekend new york city 101 107 and 108 three-day run of the heat index there that's pretty hardcore uh, especially for New York City. Guys, this is the kind of heat you're used to feeling down there in the south. Georgia, southern Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, South Carolina, Arkansas, Louisiana. But it does get heat. It does get hot up this way. New York could see more blackouts as sweltering heat wave sets in. Now, I didn't see this part. That said, we're not forecasting widespread record high temperatures since... We're in what is typically the hottest time of the year. That benchmarks for setting heat records is very high. Friday and Saturday have the best shot at setting several record highs from the range of the Rockies into the northeast, just as long as they're not recording these temperatures from the airport. These are the actual temperatures. Kansas City, 97, 96 on Friday and Saturday. A little bit of relief on Sunday. 80 degrees is going to feel very nice after they go through a 97, 96 degrees. And then the heat index is going to be near 110. Chicago, 97, 98. That's very hot. The average high in Chicago is 84 degrees at this time of the year. I think the biggest uh, would be the New York one for sure. Uh, three days in the 90s in New York City. 92, 97, and 96. Their average highs are 84 degrees. So, guys, it's important. Uh, if you live in these the pink areas, uh, it, it, you need to limit your outdoor activities. Um, stay hydrated. But if you don't have to be outside during this excessive heat warning, don't go outside. Try to stay cool. If you are outside, go to the lake. Make sure you have that sunblock. Go to the pool. But honestly, even being outside that long, even in the pool, can still take its toll. Guys, heat stroke is nothing to mess with. Okay? So very important to heed these heat warnings as well as the cold warnings too. And I think the reason why I'm spending a little time with this is just because this heat wave that we're getting, again, is in areas that I don't usually see high. Like I said, I've lived in Ohio all my life. Only a few times have I felt heat indices as high as 108, 110 degrees. It's impressive. For Columbus, Ohio, even up in Detroit, 107, 108, those are the heat indexes. Again, not real surface temperatures. Very, very, very hot, humid, and very oppressive conditions when the dew points are in the 70 degree mark. So, let's take a look at some GFS. There's our live infrared satellite information. All clear here in the Northeast. Michigan, a little bit of action, maybe some showers across Ohio right now. Other than that, nothing more than a typical summer night and it is hot in most areas. Start us off tomorrow, some scattered showers across the Northeast, along the East Coast, through the Ohio, Tennessee Valley, as well as in the South. Other than that, the northwest stays dry. We get through Friday. Dries out too. Most of the country looking good on Friday. And some showers and storms down in the south. Nothing too crazy for Friday. So that heat is locked and loaded. And Saturday, July 20th, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, you're going to remain dry. That's mainly the reason why we're going to see this heat indices go up really high. And really, 
uh, just in the areas that we were talking about with um, the heat right in here. This is the main reason why this weekend we're going to see such hot temperatures. It's going to be dry for a change. Makes you wonder if we hadn't had all of this rain over the past several months, how much hotter it might be. So this flooding rain, there might be a silver lining to this at this point. Got a little something going on here on the 21st out in Oklahoma, Kansas, Colorado border area, Nebraska, Iowa, Wisconsin. Little shower activity gets a little heavy, picks up and moves across Nebraska and the southern parts of Iowa, heavier in parts of Missouri, and inundating the Midwest, Kentucky, Tennessee Valley. And again, by the 22nd, another intense line of showers moves through the same spot in Kansas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri. As this system gets flushed out by another high pressure system, bringing in drier air, pushing this system off very slowly off to the east coast by Tuesday. This system, Wednesday, July 24th, finally makes its way off of our coast. And we are dry once again on Wednesday, July 24th, for the most part. High pressure trying to settle in in the middle of our country, and it successfully does for a couple of days, but then the rain chances come back later next week into late weekend into Saturday. And honestly, it's just going to be some scattered normal rain showers right now. Nothing too serious on the near future. Now, if we go out a little bit further, um, the GFS is showing us a wet, stormy pattern in the same areas, basically. High pressure coming in almost in the exact same spots, creating these little domes. I guess the good news is, so far, looking at our GFS radar, we are not locating any kind of tropical development in the Atlantic or in the Gulf. At least the GFS isn't picking it up. Not saying that there's not a chance for uh, any kind of storms, but it would have to be a rapidly intensified one uh, within days, because at this point, GFS is just not picking it up. Um, dry, di dry days for Nebraska, Kansas, Iowa, Missouri, they're there in between a couple of good dousings of rain. Mainly the focus is going to be on the Ohio Valley eastward into the northeast over the next couple of weeks. We're going to see increased chances of moisture in the south, uh, across Kentucky, West Virginia, and up into the northeast. Not as much as originally thought in the northeast. That's coming more recent than later. But again, the wet pattern for Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, in the south, and the northeast does not look like it's letting up anytime soon. Also, we got to include some of the central plain states like Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, Missouri, parts of Arkansas, and of course the deep south. So again, very fair chances for rain for the rest of this month here in the states. And let's go ahead. I just have to see what we've seen here on temperatures. Have we changed it all? Let's see. I mean, goodness gracious. The heat is on for sure this weekend. But, I mean, we're looking at daytime highs after July 20th. I mean, geez, 70s everywhere. 60s across Pennsylvania. So this area that we're seeing the lighter yellows and the orange colors right in here, this was the area predicted by weather.com to see the cooler air for the end of July. So let's just focus on that and see what our daytime highs end up being. As GFS would probably likely so far somewhat agree. But look at that. The northern, wow, northern plain states definitely feeling a little bit. I mean, parts of Indiana, daytime highs, 70 degrees on July 30th, the dog days of summer. Parts of Ohio, 64 degrees near Toledo. Detroit. 66 degrees July 30th for your daytime high. And really, when you go back and look at Kansas and Nebraska, half the state, the western parts of these states are going to be hot. But what about the, the, the rest of these states? Half of the states are going to be in the mid-70s to lower 70s. So my concern is, is not so much about dry weather, but are we getting enough heat? Are we getting enough sunlight? And time will tell, especially when we get closer to the harvest. And we start to see temperatures starting to rise a little bit more in the south and midwest. But 
There again is a sharp cooling area right here that's present in early August. Mid 60s, lower 60s for highs, Minnesota, North Dakota, parts of South Dakota, parts of Northern Iowa. August 3rd, daytime highs. I don't see how any crop is going to do good in Iowa with this kind of temperatures coming on. Look at this. I'm going backwards. Sorry about that. Our best chance of getting some real heat in Iowa is this weekend. That's it. There's Wednesday. There's this weekend. Insane. So you get less precipitation, but you're also a little bit cooler, unfortunately. And we're just going to have to wait and see how that bodes with the crop. Mario, would you like to come over here and say hello to everybody in the chat? I know it's been a long day. Uh, we have uh, Mario. Mario's work never seems to be ever finished. You know, that's pretty it, fair to say, right? I, I get overwhelmed because it's like there's a lot of editing, there's a lot of research, and then there's a lot of communication. A lot of research times the communication times how many different social media platforms. It, it gets sort of like ooh. This is a lot. We were actually just talking uh, in the chat. SoulQuest216 just put, does anyone else get prepper fatigue? You know, not just the hard work we put into the channel, but you as a viewer just simply absorbing the information. Stressful. Doing your own research. The stress of planning, researching. Um, trying to MacGyver the best way to do something and have plans in place. It is exhausting. Uh, definitely. Um, let's see. <laughs> There's just so much like going on in the chat. It's hard. I didn't take I didn't do a good job taking notes in the chat today because I was chasing around little fur babies. Driving <laughs> me crazy right now live. Um, and uh, actually, Annie says, can GSM affect people's mental health? <laughs> Not talking about from lack of food, etc., but it seems some people I know are behaving differently lately. A little nuts. Cosmic rays? Yeah, you know. I mean, <laughs> we, we've been told that cosmic rays do affect the mental health you know, to, a, to, a, to a degree. Sasha Dobler of AbruptEarthChanges.com uh, he has a book that actually goes into detail people back in, I don't remember what year it was, but uh, just showing signs of psychosis and, and weird mental anomalies. So uh, it, it's crazy to me. It feels like everyone is so hostile and lacking compassion and uh, just... It's weird. Everyone's at each other's throats. It could be political. It could be online. It's no one knows how to just sort of step back, be diplomatic and nice anymore. It seems that we have had our battles ourselves. Like people on the same sides at war with each other. It's 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 hard to witness, and we do our best to you know just stay positive and keep things going. But yeah. We live in some very weird, interesting times uh, to observe. So, what can I say, Jake? I don't know. Uh, Josh Mich Mitchell said, Jake, where he is in the northwestern corner of Missouri, the corn is great. And uh, he has five to seven, it's five to seven feet tall. So, I, I don't know a whole lot about growing corn. I just, you know. That's good. Hopefully That's a good, good height. I mean, look, I mean, there are going to be, I did report tonight in the crop report. There are some crops out there that are rated excellent. My point is, is that this year's percentage of good and excellent crop plants are, are way down from what they were last year. So, I'm not doubting that there are some fields out there that have good growth right now, but to see the, the amount of, or the lack of, good to excellent condition is a little concerning so I, I don't have a whole lot it just 
people, we know this is a tough topic to, to combat. Just don't forget to take care of yourself. And sometimes it's good just to step back and take a break and enjoy the little things. Get out into the garden and, you know, get offline, stop researching and just do the little things. Go for a swim in this hot weather, you know, just enjoy a little bit of life. Don't let the future and, and this information consume you. Um, because I think a lot of people, it gets a little overwhelming and depressing, you know? But that's all I got. I hate to be a Debbie Downer, G. No, and actually, um, before I forget, I, I wanted to make a comment about the, uh, the SNAP benefits being staggered. You know, folks, I've only lived in two different states. In both of those states, I've never, ever heard of dates getting staggered only when our government goes through a government shutdown is the only time I've ever heard of uh, benefits being delayed. So for those of you who are commenting and say it's been like this for decades, it's news to me. And it may be that way in your state for decades. But the, the point of the article is that they were delaying the release of benefits to help with the food shortages. It's not about, oh my God, they're delaying your food stamp benefits. It's the reason why they were doing it. That's what concerned me. That's why we shared that article because they actually came out and said, we want to help the food shortage problem that we're having. So we're going to stagger the dates here in Nevada. And apparently they don't do that. And, it, you know, to me, it was just to show you guys, like there is people that are actually getting truthful information when it comes to this food shortage situation. It's minor right now, but if they're already making changes this year, I, mean, I sound like a broken record. Next year is going to be worse, I guess. And we'll have to just hopefully everybody gets with the message, gets prepared, and gets ready for what is coming in the near future. So that being said, guys, thank you for tuning in once again. Check out our Facebook and Twitter pages. Also, check us out on Patreon. Um, of course, if you're new to the channel tonight, please like and share and subscribe. Hit the bell notification. And when you do, make sure you click on the all when it says what kind of notifications you want to get custom just click on the all that way you get all the alerts when we do go live on this channel guys we will be live to you I think we had a little bit of success with a midday Sunday show so I think we're gonna repeat it again our friend Henrik will join us for a little bit of commentary and just a little discussion really on Sunday about the weather it's been a while since we talked to him about his part of the woods so Henrik can share with us the climate news over there and how things are in Denmark always interesting to hear uh, people's perspective from all over the world in fact eventually it'd be nice to have a Sunday roundtable so uh, Mari is working on something like that in the near future where Sundays could be more of about discussions unless we have breaking news that we just have to report on all right with that being said guys thank you again for tuning in and we will be live again Sunday at 3 p.m. Eastern time until then we will talk soon